Hello, people. Nice to see you all. Um, so thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, so uh, Lydia has asked me to send us out. And um, so I feel when it comes to ascending, let there be one thought and some great stories. Is that good? Yeah. So um, if you have your Bibles, could you come with me to uh, a lovely little story? In our church in South Auckland, um, we did the book of Acts, and um, it took us three years to get through. Um, so, uh, and as I was teaching through the book of Acts, I, in a sense, chanced upon this delightful little story that um, I shared in Walkworth, and Lydia said, oh, could you do the same? And I'm more than happy to do so. So, if, if you come with me to Acts 9, and... At the beginning of Acts 9, you get that wonderful conversion of Saul. But I want to pick up the narrative, pick up the story uh, in verse 10. And it goes like this. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision. Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up, said the Lord to him, and go to the street called Straight. Don't you just love this? <laughs> I think this is awesome. Inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Look, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming and laying his hands on him so that he can see again. So, you know, you get the situation of, you know, um, uh, two men having, in a sense, a vision about each other. Um, and then we come up to verse 13, and it says this. Well, Lord, replied Ananias, I've heard about this man from several people, all about how he's done wicked things to your holy people in Jerusalem. And now he's come here with authority from the chief priest to tie up everybody who calls on your name. Just go, replied the Lord. He is a chosen vessel for me to carry my name before nations and kings and the children of Israel too. I'm going to show him how many, how many things he is going to have to suffer for the sake of my name. Verse 17, so Ananias set off, went into the house and laid his hands on him. Brother Saul, he said, the Lord has sent me. Uh, yes, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, so that you may be able to see again and receive the Holy Spirit. And at once something like scales fell off his eyes. And he was able to see, and he got up and was baptized. And he had something to eat and regained his strength. And then we read on, and I'll just read out some kind of um, scattered verses. And then Saul stayed with the disciples in Damascus for a few days. Uh, verse 22, but Saul grew all the stronger and threw the Jews in Damascus into confusion and um, and then verse 24, but Saul got wind of their plan, and so on and so on. On verse 26, when he got back to Jerusalem, uh, this is Saul, and, uh, and so it goes on. So, um, friends, if you were in my shoes this morning, and you, this was your text for sending us out, what's the one point that you would glean from this for all of us? Tell the person next to you, if you like them, if you don't, Turn around to someone else. Go to it. <laughs> oh dear, that's so good. You guys cannot see, but in the front row here, all my friends here have got scorecards on ranging from one to ten, ten being great on how I'm going thus far. <laughs> and that'll be Simon Ponsonby's doing. <laughs> okay. So, um, I don't know, and you can keep those scorecards down to the end now. <laughs> Oh, that was so good. Um, I don't know, friends, what point you would glean from that passage. Uh, but sometimes to understand one story, and I'm going to come back to that passage later on, 
But sometimes to understand one story, you have to tell other stories. So I just want you to relax this morning and enjoy some of these stories that I'm about to share. How many here, first story, how many here have um, read Tim Winton? Oh my goodness. You are an illiterate bunch. Okay. <laughs> Tim Winton. Tim Winton in Australia is um, arguably one of their finest writers. Uh, he is a prize winning author of fiction, and I've read a number of his books. And he was being interviewed on TV in Australia by an interviewer by the name of Denton. And they were talking about being a novelist and so on. And then it got to the point where Denton turned uh, and locked eyes with um, Tim Winton and said to Tim, Tim, I believe that when you were five, something truly momentous happened in your life. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing it. And almost with a tear in his eye, Tim began to recount a story from his past. And it went like this. He said, you know, he said, my dad, my dad was a policeman and he rode a bike. That was his job. Um, and one day my dad was involved in a horrendous accident and crash such that he was reduced to a coma. He was in hospital for a long time, but he came out of the coma. So Tim is telling this in the interview, this incident, this crash that occurred when he was five. And eventually they brought him home in an ambulance. And Tim, who was five, he just looked at this hulk of a man that was coming through the door. And for him, it was not his father. Because what he saw before him was this guy who was just all bent out of shape, twisted, black, bloodied and bruised and beaten up by this crash. And Tim was somewhat scared. And so he sort of stepped back. And then they had to, as a family, get into the routine of trying to care for their dad and her husband. And his wife, um, this policeman's wife, she was a petite little woman. And her greatest challenge, day in, day out, was how did she get her big man into the bath to, cleanse, to clean him? And somehow this need got out in the town. And then one day there was a knock at the door. So she goes to the door and she opens the door and, and here's this Aussie bloke. And she says, is there anything I can do? You know, do you need someone or something? And he says, uh, good day. Um, I'll see if I can get this. <laughs> he says, the name's Liam. And I hurt you in a bit of bother. Um, so is there anything I can do? So uh, <laughs> it's not bad, not bad, not bad, not bad. <laughs> so, um, so he, um, and she says to Len, this Baptist from this town, she says, uh, Yes, there is something that you could do. Would you mind coming here every day to bathe my man? So this Aussie bloke, he turns up every day, week after week, month after month. And he comes in and he picks up this battered policeman, takes him to the bathroom, derobes him, places him in the bath, soaks him, pulls him out, dries him off, robes him and carries him to the bed. And he did this, as I say, week after week and month after month. And little Tim, age five, and the rest of the family, they just saw this whole thing being played out and acted out. And they were just so impressed. So impressed. And then Tim in this interview said, you know, when each of us, individually and independent of each other, got to our time of awakening about spiritual things, the thing that became the hinge moment, the thing that became the turning point, the thing that flicked us into wanting to search more about spiritual things in life was that incident about Lamb. And that was it. And you see, if you go to Australia... Nigh on everyone knows about Tim Winton. 
But no one, but no one knows about Len. But today, Len is a legend in heaven. Did you get that? A second story, and it goes like this. A true story. There was this guy at uh, school, just creamed the exams, did so very, very well. And then he did so well, he scored a position at Yale University. And again, just kind of flew through, straight A's as it were. And his great ambition in life, this guy, was to be a prize-winning novelist. That was his ambition in life. But when he graduated from Yale, the only job eventually that he could score, the only job that he could score was to become a uh, chemist, chemistry book proofreader in this concrete jungle of an office in a far back office. That's the only job. So in a sense, his dream, it sort, of, it sort of became a shattered nightmare on the floorboards of his life. And, and he used to just trudge to work every day, you know, somewhat down and depressed and lamenting his lot. And um, as he walked to his back corner office, there was a Christian in a nearby office, and his, he was a graphic designer, and his name was Ed. And every morning as Ed saw this guy walk by, Ed would say, good day, good morning. And that carried on for weeks and months. And then one day, this guy who was the chemistry proofreader, the guy who wanted to be the great novelist, he walked by Ed's office and he was so downcast. It was written all over his skin bag, his body. And so um, Ed walked out and, and said to him, hey, I see that you're really quite down. Is there, what is going on? He said, a family member of mine ha has just come down with cancer and the prognosis is not good. And Ed immediately said, he said, well, I'll pray for him. But the guy who was the chemistry proofreader, he was an atheist, and he didn't want to have anything to do with that kind of language. So they had this kind of debate, and it got to the point where they just had to leave it at that and go their separate ways and get back to work. And so the days and the weeks went by again, and they just said hello to each other. And then one day there was a knock on Ed's door, and here is this chemistry proofreader, and he is weeping. And he said, the prognosis is now very, very serious. I mean, we're looking at, you know, curtains, exit. We're looking at death. And then Ed, this Christian guy, in a normal office, he just said to this person, well, how about we pray now? And how about you pray with me? And this guy was so distraught and distressed, you know. He said, yes. So they sat in the office, and Ed proceeded to pray. And as he prayed for the sick family member, God opened the heart of this chemistry proofreader, like the story of Lydia. I mean, in the prayer for another, this guy's heart was opened, and something shifted within him, and he became a Christ follower. And today in America... Nigh on, well, many people know this guy. And I've read, he's, he's become a best-selling author. And I've read a number of his books. And his name is Eric Matakis. Mm. Some of you have read him. And he's a well-known person. But Ed, no one remembers Ed. But today, Ed is a legend is a legend in heaven. Do you like this? One final story. There was this woman, and she was a lesbian, and she was a rabid atheist, and she was into Freud and Hegel, and she was a Marxist and so on. And um, she, was, she was a tenured professor, and she led, you know, the gay rights uh, movement on campus. And, I mean, she's just this uh, person full of 
uh, outrage and just you know, a, a, a thoroughgoing activist and so on. And uh, she had a lover, a lesbian lover. And one day, and she was in the middle of writing a book against Christianity. True story. And then one day she was just writing away and she was watching the TV at the same time. And as she watched the TV, she began to hear certain language that alarmed her. And so she turned the TV up a little bit more and stopped writing. And what she heard and what she saw on TV was this um, uh, a Christian uh, spokesperson from, you know, in America, and you just got to place it in context here and bless them, but this, this American on the extreme, extreme right of Christendom. Um, so I, I, you get the picture here, and bless him, but you know. So, and um, he, he came out, and, and he started to use the F word. And for him, the F word was feminism, uh, capital F. And he treated it like that. I mean, you know, most of us here see there's a place for feminism, lowercase f. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but for this this guy, it was like the F word, you know. And, and then he started to say in strident terms, he said, you know, and these feminists, you know, they're to blame for, you know, they're breaking up marriages, they're killing their children, you know, they are practicing witchcraft, they're destroying capitalism, and they're causing a number of women in this country to become lesbians. And he just went on this tirade. It just sort of like a volcano spewed out of his mouth. And, um, and she became so incensed by this. And she wondered what she should do. So she thought, well, I'll write an article in response, and I'll get it published in a number of places such that many of his camp will read it. And so she pumped out this article, and, uh, and, and true, it got published and so on. And then the inevitable happened. And it was that the mail came in to her office. And mail after mail after mail. And so she wondered what she should do with all of this mail. So she got some tissue boxes and em emptied the tissue boxes off the tissues. And she put a tissue box there and she put a tissue box there. And when she read one letter, and it was obviously hate mail, she put it there. And then she got another letter, hate mail, hate mail, hate mail. And then she would get the occasional fan mail and put it over in this tissue box. And this went on for some time. And she had to get more tissue boxes for over here. Um, and then she received a letter. And she read it and read it again. And she thought, Stokes, where does this go? And she sort of went, uh, no, and no. And because in this letter she received, she was, it, it was like they disagreed with her arguments, but they weren't sort of having an argument, they were making an argument. And when they made an argument with her, it was in such a people-honoring manner. And the kind of the letter, it oozed respect. But it was clear about the disagreement, that her conclusions didn't quite match up with the premises of her argument. So she just didn't know. And then she thought, well, stuff it. So she screwed it up and threw it into the corner of her room. She came back later that night, and she remembered this letter. So she went to the corner, and she unraveled it, and she proceeded to read this letter again. And she noticed this time round that there was an invitation from the writers of this letter to come and have a meal with her. And the invitation was from Ken and Flo. So, so she thought, well, you know, she was this kind of I'm up for anything kind of woman. So she thought, oh, I'll rock up to their place. I will accept this invitation. Got in touch with them. And she went and had a meal with them and loved the evening. The room was just filled with people honoring behavior. And, and so for months and for years, nigh on five years, they became really good friends. And they each had meals in each other's houses. They met each other's uh, friends. And they read each other's books. And they really did read each other's books. 
And then after about five years of this, this young woman by the name of Rosario, she, she tossed and turned one night, and the reason being was what she was wrestling with herself, whether she should go to their church. And the following morning, she woke up and said to her lesbian lover who was lying next to her, I'm off to church. <laughs> so, so the lesbian lover just turned over, you know, just didn't know what to do with that. And um, so Rosario, she got out of bed and she went to this church, sat in the back row. Churches can be scary places sometimes. Sat in the back row and she attended that church for seven years. And then one Sunday, while she's in this church, she was just seated there. And again, it was like her heart was opened. And she saw Jesus in a, in a new way, in a fresh way, for the very first time. And you know what, do you know what's happened to Rosario? And this is her story. It's not everybody's story. This is her story. But she found a way into uh, heterosexuality. And she ended up marrying a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> uh, and she's written a brilliant book. And really at the heart of the book is a most reluctant conversion, a little bit like C.S. Lewis. Um, and um, her name is Rosario Butterfield. And you see, she's becoming a well-known person. But no one will remember Ken and Flo. But today, Ken and Flo are legends, are legends in heaven. So I come back to finish. I come back to that text. And you know, there is Paul, you know, he's having a vision uh, about someone who's having a vision about Paul. I know it's confusing, but that's Christendom. And they're just having, and, and so in this vision, you know, Ananias is being asked to go and to pray for this guy called Saul. And, and we might think, no big deal. But when you put Saul in context, I mean, Saul, he was this, he was the zealot. He was this hardliner. He was fanatical. Saul was a super orthodox, pharisaical Jew. I mean, Saul, I mean, think Taliban. I mean, Saul was killing people. I mean, Saul was one scary son of Israel. I mean, he was, I mean, who would want to go and pray for this guy? And so Ananias, he's one of those Christians who does as he's told. He's a Christian, not just a believer, but he's a behavior. And God says, go pray. So uh, Ananias, he rocks up. And gets real, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, face on face, skin on skin sort of stuff. And he lays his hands on this guy Saul. And the scales they drop. And this guy Saul, he, he sees a number of things for the very first time in his life. And then if you read the rest of the narrative and you read the rest of the book of Acts, it is all about Saul. And we do not hear about Ananias again. But here's the deal. Scripture sort of almost tells us that this was Ananias' moment. And maybe Ananias knew that, so he didn't get it wrong. And as you and I, we leave this wonderful few days that we have together. Look, I tell you, dear friends, moments are going to come towards you. And they will be hinge moments. They will be turning moments. They, for some, will be turnaround moments. And who knows? But that if you don't get it wrong, Someone of note may emerge and other people will remember those, those people, but they may never, never remember you. But I'll tell you this, in heaven, because you seized that moment and didn't get it wrong, you will be a legend 
in heaven. And I can't think of a better way to finish this gathering. Is that right? So friends, there are moments out there, moments for you to seize and to get right. What a wonderful way to live. And of course, you know, when you, you've got to learn to dance with the moments. You do, because there are steps and there are missteps. So I've written a book about this. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so here's the book. It's called Alongsiders, and it's all about this. And there are a few remaining copies at the back of the book, at the back of the thing there. Now, 20 bucks if you want me to sign them, 2250. So, um, <laughs> so um, uh, yeah. So I, I just wanted you to leave. I, I mean, I don't know what the time is now. And I'm, actually, I'm finishing really early. Look, I've, can I just tell one more story? Look, it, it's, I chanced upon this the other day. And it goes like this. How many here know the story of Wilberforce? You know, Amazing Grace. Now, there was a time, <clears throat> there was a time in his life where he was the hot number in town. I mean, everybody, and I mean everybody, wanted a bit and piece of him because, I mean, this was a time when he was kind of the party goer and he just rocked and rolled, you know. He was the hot number in town. And, um, and then his mother got seriously, seriously ill and, and, the, and the doctors of the day said, oh, you've got to get to a better climate. So he, she said, where would this be? And they said, you've got to get to the Italian and French Riverieras. Um, French Riverieras. And, um, and so... Um, so they knew then that that would be, uh, they would need two coaches drawn by horses. I mean, it was in the 18th century. And, and, um, and they would both need companions. So the mum got a companion, and William, I mean, he thought, who's going to be my companion? And then he chose this guy by the, na uh, by the name of Isaac. And Isaac was a kind of a six-foot you know, seven sort of guy. And did you know that Wilberforce was about 5'3"? And so, and just a small little man, but with a huge heart and an incredible mind. And so they launched out on this trip that lasted for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and of course, Isaac and, and Wilberforce were in the second carriage, and, and they had to just engage in conversation. And as I say, at that time, he was a member of parliament, but he was nowhere near God at all at that time. And they got into robust debate, rigorous debate. And at one point, uh, Isaac um, started to talk about a Methodist minister that he knew. And he raved about this Methodist minister. Um, and at that point, Wilberforce went for the jugular and strongly disagreed and, and, and so they had this conversation. But what amazed and staggered Wilberforce was that this guy, he engaged in debate and he underlined, um, you know, Christ in this Methodist minister. And that, my friends, I don't know if you knew this, was the turning point in Wilberforce's life. And it was all because someone by the name of Isaac entered into a needed discussion and didn't back off, didn't back away. And everybody, but everybody, remembers Wilberforce. But how many here has heard of Isaac? Isaac Milner. But today, he's a legend in heaven. I think it's fantastic. Bless you people.